digital dementia. That's what this video is going to be about. I want to read what uh, a subscriber wrote in the comments section. I'm reading this because I have had so many experiences just like this. Well, the details were different, but the outcome was the same. Yesterday at Home Depot, I asked the girl in the nursery department if the tomatoes outside were the only tomatoes on display. The girl said, yes, I believe so. Then uh, she said, the reason I ask is because yesterday there were some tomatoes and other fruits and vegetables all around the store. The girl says nothing. So she said, so do you know if these are the only ones? The girl said, yes, I think so. She said, but do you know for sure? The girl said, no. So she said, okay, then thanks for finally giving me an answer to my question. I'll ask someone else who does know. Wanting to pull my hair out. Yes. So these kinds of encounters I have so often in stores when you ask a question. What you get is, I think so. So you can't tell me definitively. It's your job to know, but you don't know. And then they stare at you. At a QT gas station here in Anderson, South Carolina, where I go regularly, I was at the gas pump and all of a sudden I, I was filling up my um, tank with gas and all of a sudden the gas started pouring out from the pump. Well that was quite dangerous and it spilled all over um, outside stained my car as it you know got on my car so I went inside and there was a girl who was working behind the counter at the cash register and I said I just wanted to let you know that gas had um, kind of spewed out of one of the gum gas pumps and I was on number one or number two and she just looked at me and said nothing and I was thinking okay it's your turn now to say something and she said nothing I said it that's dangerous and she said okay and I said okay what and she said and it was like a delayed reaction every time. And then she said, I will tell my manager. I felt as if I was in front of a zombie. I go to stores and if I, uh, let's say the amount is um, 502 or I, I, better yet, four ninety-seven. But I don't want the pennies, so I give a five-dollar bill and a nickel, or I'm I'm sorry, um, I give two cents. Do you know how many of the young are literally stumped? I can see they don't know what to do. And I said. My, chi my change will be a nickel. Our younger generations, we are living a time unprecedented and we have younger generations who literally do not know how to function in this world. If they're not getting their answers immediately from their smartphone. I want you to listen to this. 
and really play, pay close attention. I can't even imagine what the suicide and, and homicide and just the rates of depression, you know, an accidental death due to overdose are going to look like in the future. It's going to reach epidemic proportions. It's already, the, 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 the statistics are already alarming and yet nobody's sounding any alarm bells. Digital dementia. This is a real medical term right now. This is the idea that we're outsourcing our brains to our smart devices. We're so reliant on our smartphones that our smartphones are making us stupid. Does that make sense? That, I mean, it's convenient. I don't want to... I, I don't want to memorize 500 phone numbers, right? Nobody wants to do that. But we've lost the ability to memorize one. Like if I give you a seven digit number now, how difficult, um, would it be you find that kind of difficult to memorize? Like a phone number that you used to do years ago? Yes or yes? Because we've, our, if I take my arm, I put it into a sling for six months, does it stay the same? Would it even grow stronger? It would what? It would atrophy and grow weaker. Same thing with your mental muscles. If you're relying on your phone to keep your schedules, your to-dos, do simple... I went out to dinner with 10 people uh, recently. There was a 10 of us. And three people at the end pulled out their phones to divide the check, the bill, by 10. We've lost the ability to be able to do certain things. And so what, that's where digital dementia is. Smart devices could be extremely convenient, but they could be crippling also. So it could be a balance. Can I borrow someone's phone, please? Anyone? Thank you. Okay, there is a subconscious reaction to these devices when we use them. Okay? What if I were to hold my phone while I'm talking to you? I'm not checking it, it's not buzzing, it's not beeping. I'm not even, I'm nothing. I'm just holding it. Do you feel at this moment that you are the most important thing to me right now? No, you do not. Because there is a subconscious reaction we have to the device. When it is out, it makes the people around us feel that they are less important. So when walk, we're walking down the halls in our offices and somebody says, hey boss, can I ask you a question? You go, sure, what's on your mind? We've just told them they're not that important. Or we can go, sure, what's on your mind? And if you don't have a pocket, find a shelf, put it on the shelf, come back and say, sure, what's on your mind? When we show up to a meeting or a lunch or a dinner with our colleagues, our clients or our friends or our families, and we put the phone on the table, we have announced to everyone in the room that they are not that important to us. And by the way, putting the phone upside down is not more polite. <laughs> My favorite one is in the meeting or at a lunch with someone that the phone will ring and the caller ID will pop up and they will go, I'm not gonna get it. Oh, so magnanimous. Oh, I'm lucky to eat with you today. Or they could just put the damn thing away. You can tell how addicted we are. When somebody pulls out their phone when you're with them, how uncomfortable does that make us feel? You're walking down the street with someone, they pull their phone out. We feel stupid, so what do we do? We pull our phones out. We're so addicted, somebody goes to the bathroom when we're at dinner and what do we have to sit there by ourselves? God forbid we should look around the room for five minutes. We pull our phones out. Meetings, awful. What do we do when a meeting happens, right? Everybody's sitting waiting for the meeting to start. Bob's running a few minutes late. Bob's here? Okay, start the meeting. Do you know when relationships are built? All that in between time. Thank you very much. Parents have to intervene. We have to stop giving our kids free access to social media and, and phones at young ages. They are not ready for it. Their minds cannot cope with the dopamine. Balance is fine. You can give a kid a phone, but they can't use it in their bedroom. They can't have it at the dinner table. They can't take it to school. They can only have it up to a certain hour and you take it away. They're children. You can take the phone away. We've got to intervene as parents. But as companies, we now have to deal with the influx of kids that are coming into our companies with addiction. Watch. I see it all the time. Walk through any office. You'll see the older employees have their phones on the sides of their computers as they're working. You'll see the youngest employees have their phones face up in front of their keyboards between their arms as they're working. And this is how they work. And the, the science is alarming. They did uh, experiments on mice where they, they did the multitasking. They, they changed the... They, changed, they put flashing lights to mimic going from the computer to the cell phone, the computer to the cell phone, to the TV. The mice that were exposed to the changing lights, it took them three times longer 
to solve a maze than the mice that weren't, and the damage was permanent. It didn't improve when they stopped the lights. We have a real problem here, a real problem. Uh, how is it that schools permit children to bring phones into their classrooms? Is this just another method of dumbing down the younger generations? Of course it is. Of course it is. Early onset dementia, a national challenge, a future crisis. Half a million Americans under the age of 20, uh, 65 who have dementia or cognitive impairment at a level of severity consistent with dementia it is, the numbers are between 220,000 and 640,000 with early onset Alzheimer's or uh, related dementia. Alzheimer's, I always thought you cannot diagnose uh, until they're dead and you autopsy, but dementia. Okay, well, you can read the key findings here. Getting a diagnosis for early onset Alzheimer, Alzheimer's or, and dementia presents serious problems for individuals. Healthcare providers generally don't look for the disease in younger patients, and it can therefore be months or years before they get the right diagnosis. Um, most have no health insurance, they can't get Medicare, and if they're not diagnosed properly, they're not going to be treated properly, you can't get disability, certainly if you don't even know what your problem is. We didn't see early onset dementia. We didn't even hear about it until the recent decades and the recent years now we're hearing it more and more and more. So we've got to look at environmental causes for this very significant change. And uh, I'll link below to these articles. And this is, this is where I got that video from. But you know what? 28 years ago, our enslavement was predicted and we're still not listening. No, we're still not listening. This is a really interesting article I found. I will link below to it. I'm not going to read the whole thing. An untold future lies ahead, and for the first time, I face it with a sense of hope. For if a machine, a terminator, can learn the value of human life, maybe we can too. Sarah Connor. So this uh, was written by a, um, a man who, when he was a kid, when he first heard that quote, uh, it was shocking how we could even think machines have feelings and, and could learn the value of human life. Well, machines now, they're coming out saying that robots will have feelings, uh, but none of this is good. But when he was watching The Terminator, you know, as a kid, he wasn't a big fan. The Matrix, he thought was cool. He thought was cool. But he never got any literal message from it. Um, I've watched The Matrix so many times, but never really thought to myself, what it meant to be or how I would connect it to the Terminator until these days. So as he was commuting to work, you know, he would do, you know, put the um, earplugs in and listen to metal music, read tech books, um, stare at the traffic jams going on in the city. But it wasn't until he made a conscious decision to pay attention. To pay attention, did he understand what was happening in the world? 
So, after a while, he said, it's more common now that I find myself watching others during commute just because I want to see how smartphones are influencing normal human behavior. Every day you can see things like people bumping into each other without apologizing, parents so into their phones that they forget to watch their kids, couples that won't speak a single word for a whole 30 minutes because they're staring at their phones, uh, the technological advances, have they been positive advances? Well, you can, yeah, there have been enormous positive advances. But on the whole, when you look at what has happened to the human race with technology, you cannot assess that advance as positive. It has had a tremendously negative effect. Thanks to smartphones, humankind is being alienated of its true nature. And the best part of that is that it didn't require machines to be self-aware, feel, or think, but a bunch of brilliant, hard-working developers coming up with this technology. We are preferring contact through limited voice messages rather than having a real talk. We are interrupting real conversations to read what someone else texted you. <clears throat> we are caring more about the unknown folk cat rather than the friend in front of us looking for advice. We seek to be more connected to people we care about, creating connections that are meaningless or superficial. We are caring too much about how others see our perfect lives, our persona on social media through apps, through smartphones. Human beings are a social species by design and in my opinion and it's it's natural to try and find connections or to look for a tool that makes us uh, the article is not written all that well it's got some typos and stuff but that makes it easier for us to socialize but the way we are socializing is not the best way. If we care more about the digital world than the real one, our reality can be easily replaced by an idea that would not necessarily be the truth. It would only be what we want to see. We are digging our own tombs and allowing controlling mechanisms to control us. We are the ones that are creating this situations, this situation. And if we didn't, if we don't change that, sorry, we will be sitting on chairs with screens on our faces all day. Or is that already happening? It's already happening. It's already happening. I want to ask a question. How many of you have real trusting relationships, not via your smartphone or computer. In real life, how many of you sit down with other friends and talk to them without your phones present? How many of you get annoyed when you are out engaging with somebody and they're constantly going to their phone, checking, you know, if, if they got a text or how many times are you sitting there trying to engage with somebody, trying to have like real conversation and that phone of theirs rings and they pick it up and they start talking. This is classic rude behavior that has become acceptable. So much has become acceptable today that was never acceptable not too long ago. And if we, the individual, you, me, all of us, don't do something about this, yeah, more and more people will end up going nuts because we are relational beings. We need that 
that connection and the loss of connection has worldwide, I mean, it, it, that loss, the rapidity with which people are feeling that loss, it was great. It was, it was really um, rather incomprehensible. And there, I thought, what else could have brought us to this place if it wasn't for the smartphone? I don't know. I can't think of anything else. But, yeah, it is up to us to um, do something about it. And parents, you know, you give these children their phones. I've spoken to friends who had children, and I said, you know, that phone is really hurting them. They don't care. Now, parents, it is your job to protect your children. And you wouldn't let them at five years old do a tab of acid. You know, because you would know that that would endanger their brain. Well, guess what? You're endangering their brain. Yeah. I'll link below to it all. I'll link below to it all.